Imagine that you had a device that would allow you to see a man standing on the surface of the moon, or a dime in New York while you're standing in Los Angeles, or the width of one of my hairs here on the Pope Joy stage standing on the front steps of Intel in Rio Rancho. Such a device would be called an interferometer, and that's what we're building in southern New Mexico right now. So why would you want to build an interferometer? What exactly is this thing? Well, it turns out that if you take a lot of telescopes and you separate them very far apart, you can mimic having a much larger telescope than is possible for us to actually build with a single piece of glass, either on the ground or in space. And so my colleagues and I at New Mexico Tech and the University of Cambridge are building this optical interferometer on top of the Magdalena Ridge. It's called the Magdalena Ridge Observatory Interferometer. And it actually overlooks the site of the very large array, which many of you are probably familiar with from the movie Contact. And that is a radio interferometer. So there's another important thing about interferometers to get the resolution that you want besides the separation of the telescopes, and that's the wavelength that you're working at. And the radio interferometer, the VLA, as we call it, would have to be sized up to the diameter of the Earth to be able to get the same resolution that the Magdalena Ridge interferometer is going to get, being the size of three football fields across. Right. So I'm an astronomer, so it's fairly obvious to me why I like the stars. But it may not be obvious to you why you might want to like the stars, too. And so, the Big Bang happened about 13.8 billion years ago, and that's what started this whole cosmic ball rolling. And 100 seconds after the Big Bang, all the hydrogen and helium that exists in the universe today was formed. Everything else in the periodic table after those first two elements, hydrogen and helium, was formed inside of a star. So the clothes you're wearing, and the seat you're sitting in, and the auditorium that you're in right now, and everything that makes up your body was inside a star at some point in time. So we're all made of star stuff. And that's, that's pretty incredible when you think about it, that we're all made of the stars. So that's why we're building this optical interferometer, so that we can learn more about the stars. Now, another thing you may not recognize is that you actually carry an interferometer around with you wherever you go in the form of your two eyes. And so I'm going to have you do a little experiment with me, because I'm a physicist, and that's what we do. I would like all of you to find a distant point in the room that you can focus on, and focus on it with both of your eyes at the same time. And then raise one hand and cover one eye, and continue to look at the object. And you should notice that three things have happened when you did that. One is that the object seemed to slightly shift because you lost your parallax. Another one is that you lost your depth perception because you covered one eye, and the third one and you should maybe try this a couple times so you can, can convince yourself that I'm right, is that it got blurrier. And the reason that it got blurrier is when you're only looking through one eye, your telescope is only as big as that pupil of your eye. And when you're looking through two eyes, your telescope is as big as a separation between your two eyes. And so now you've got about 50 times more resolution. The Magdalena Ridge Observatory is going to give us 300 times the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope. So now I'm going to take you on a brief tour of our interferometer so that you can see what this looks like. So you watch up there, and I'm going to talk about it. Right now, you should see the 10 telescopes in their compact configuration very close together. And we're going to zoom in on two of them. And what I want you to think about is that the image is a piece of paper with an image on it coming down from space, and it's being intercepted by the telescopes. But it's naturally going to get to one telescope before it gets to the next one in the line. And we have to put that piece of paper back together perfectly if we're going to get the image back out. And so we have to do all these steps, which are basically the same steps that your brain does when you're looking through your two eyes together to make the image come back together again. So the light goes into the telescopes, and it travels down vacuum pipes. And the reason that we use vacuum is we don't want to harm the image that we've collected at the telescope in any way. And so now you see that the light, as we change the angle, is starting to travel down those tubes. And one beam is ahead of the other one. Can everybody see that? 
how they're traveling down together. So now we have to put them back on the same piece of paper, and we do that with something called a delay line. This is like an optical trombone. It's got a mirror on it, and it slides up and down inside a tube. And so we bring the light back together again so that they're all traveling in the same place. And now we have to shrink the light back down because our detectors are the size of postage stamps. And we have to put all of the light onto something about the size of a postage stamp. So that's what we do with something called a beam combiner. You're combining the beams back together again, and you get, oh, wait a second. Those are fringes, not an image. You have to do one more math step. Does anybody know the math step? Fourier a Fourier transform, yay! <laughs> Once you do a Fourier transform, you get your image back. So that's how we do it. Simple, right? <laughs> OK, so I'm going to show you some fantastic images that are being taken by optical interferometers today, because they do already exist. But most of them only use four telescopes to make their images. So here's this first one is of a binary system. What you're seeing is a red supergiant, and this is a loop. And what's passing in front of it is a smaller star with a dust disk around it. And this dust disk is occulting the star as it goes past so that you get a half eclipse and part of the star disappears. This image was taken by Kloppenborg and Stenzel at the University of Denver using the Merck combiner on the Chara array. The next one is of Betelgeuse. How many of you know what Betelgeuse is? OK, bright red star on the shoulder of Orion, right? This is a red supergiant. This was taken by Hobois and Perrin with the IOTA interferometer several years ago using only four telescopes. And you can see two bright spots on there, just like the sun has spots on it. Other stars do too. But we can't typically see them because we don't have that kind of resolution. And so this was taken with four telescopes. And someday, this simulation done by Chivasa and Young shows us what we might be able to do with a 10-telescope optical interferometer like MROI. See, that kind of structure on another star. And then finally, black holes, which everybody loves, right? So black holes you can't actually see because they're black. You can see them because of the absence of stars. You've got stars all around. So this is an artist's conception of a black hole. And what we want to be able to do is look at supermassive black holes in the centers of external galaxies. And the way that we are going to do that is by imaging them and looking for the hot dust and the gas bubbles. And so this is done by one of my collaborators, John Young, at the University of Cambridge. And this is the kind of hot dust that you would see around a supermassive black hole, 100 million solar masses in another galaxy. And we'll be able to do this with eight telescopes. So this is the kind of future that we've got in store for us. Now you understand how interferometers work. Now, <laughs> now you understand why I love astronomy and what I'm doing. And so I want to leave you with an invitation and a quote. The invitation is to all maintain your curiosity and your excitement about the world and to remember as you're studying all these different things that you were all once inside of a star at some point in time and you're all made of stardust. And help us see our dream through to the end with the Magdalena Ridge interferometer. We've got a long way to go before we've got it all finished. And the quote that I'm going to leave you with is one of the inspirations to me from Carl Sagan. This is kind of why I do this thing. And he said, somewhere, someday, something incredible is waiting to be known. <laughs>